Hi, my name is Kate Gibbs. I'm a local here in Inver, near British Columbia, the beautiful and friendly town of Invermere. I have, I was born with cerebral palsy, so um, my brain isn't telling my legs and my left arm here uh, how to move properly. So cerebral palsy basically is um, a brain injury, but they don't call it a brain injury because it happens at birth um, or shortly after birth. So it's caused from a, a lack of oxygen to the brain. And so parts of my brain, the parts of my brain that affect my walking or my legs has been deprived of oxygen. The part that affects my fine motor skills and my left hand that flies all over the place was affected. Um, some of my speech was affected. I've had to, I had to go to speech therapy when I was in school. Um, but it's, yeah, basically it's um, different parts of the brain that are affected because of lack of oxygen. And there are varying degrees. I do walk quite well with some support and some even some steps on my own. But for speed and independence, I use an electric wheelchair to get around. I'm on the Inclusion VC board, an advocacy group for people who have cognitive diverse abilities. I, and I do a school program called Dare to be Different. I'm going into schools and I just delivered my first diverse ability history project in the local David Thompson Secondary School. So I was born um, January 8th, 1995. I was born two weeks late. I was supposed to be born actually on Christmas Day, which would have been kind of a bummer because no one likes to share their birthday with Christmas. When I was born, um, I was born here in the Invermere Hospital. And when I was born, they, my lungs had collapsed. So less oxygen from my lungs went to my brain. So right away I was flown from Invermere Hospital to the Calgary Foothills and placed in the NICU, which is neonatal intensive care unit with all really sick babies. And I was taken care of by um, amazing, hardworking doctors and nurses. I'm not sure how they do it. Um, but you know, they like try it. I was hooked up to like a bunch of tubes and needles were poked into me and basically um, these nurses were trying to get me to breathe on, on my own. own. I was in a lineup of super sick babies. Most of them were premature, but I was like eight, eight pounds. So there was all these little guys and, and then me. But um, I was there. There was a lineup of babies from the sickest babies to the healthier. And then my mom and the rest of my family got to watch me move down the line from really, really sick to really healthy and being able to, to go home. When you're little and you're diagnosed with a diverse ability, you watch for a milestone. So if they can sit up on their own, if they can walk, if they can talk on time. And I did pretty well. My mom was so nervous once she noticed that I rolled off the bed. So I could do that by myself. I had a wonderful childhood. First of all, I um, have such a great family, you know, they supported me since day one and we, we have such a great, not just family unit, but you know, an extended family as well. I'm really close to my 
aunt and my cousin and and my uncle and they're just awesome. Especially during the first years, you go back to children's a lot for like assessments and I had one surgery. Thankfully just one a lot a lot of people with CP have a lot more. But I mostly went to the children's hospitals for like assessments and to assess my walking and how tight my muscles are, you know, to see if how well I was walking. Yeah, I lived with my aunt Joanne and cousin Stephanie in Calgary for a year and a half because I had to be followed by the children's hospital. And I actually had surgery on my legs. They wanted to lengthen my ligaments in my legs, so my legs had to be stretched out. So I guess that was the reason that both of my legs were casted. And then the bar, there was a bar in between the casts. So I was like splayed up like this and the bar was to stretch my um, hamstrings. Something, I don't remember the whole thing because I was only two and a half. And then after I got the cast off, I went right into a swimming pool at the children's hospital and to swim around and, and loosen up my muscles. So while I was in Calgary, I went to, it's called a therapy school because it, it gives like the regular preschool ex experience for children, but it's, it gives them therapy, and, like speech therapy and occupational therapy that they might not get in a regular preschool. So I went there for a year because of having to be followed by the children. And then my parents wanted to move back to Invermere. So we moved back and we actually moved back with my baby sister. She, she came, she was born in Calgary. So, um, yeah, we came back to town with me and one more kid, Natalie. Natalie is great. She, you know, when she was little, you know, she didn't exactly have a sister that she could run around with and play games with like other sisters could, but she was like one of the most patient kids I, I know, little kids. She would like open doors for us and walk places with, with us. She'd go to physio appointments and while I was doing physio, she'd like make obstacle courses for herself out of <laughs> the physio equipment, even though mom told, told her not to. But then, and then it was a little tough as she got older because she, she had to, you know, find her own way in life. So she had to make her own friends and sometimes making friends was harder for me, especially in high school. So it was hard to watch Nat kind of grow up because she grew up a little bit differently than I did, but we, we've always had a great relationship. She skis with me now. She has gotten certified to go skiing with people with diverse abilities through CADS, Canadian Adaptive Disabled Skiing. So she skis with me now and we don't get to spend a whole whack of time together, but when we do, it's pretty special. My sister and I were really close when we were little. We still are very, very close, but um, when we were little, you know, she had to go everywhere with us. So we did everything together. But um, when you're growing up, especially when you're in middle school and high school, you sort of have to make your own friend. You have to find yourself, you know, outside of your family and who you are outside of that. That part was a bit tough for me just because I didn't make friends with people my own age as well as my sister did. Um, you know, and 
it wasn't, it wasn't that I was bullied or anything like that. They was really, they were really nice to me. I just, I couldn't go from that, that, I couldn't take it a step further. Like, um, and it was mostly on me because I, I, um, I didn't, I was always really close with the aides that helped me. We're still friends to this day, but I, so I always wanted to spend time with them because I really enjoyed their company, but they sort of always wanted me to be with my peers and because they say that, you know, teachers aren't really supposed to be your friends. They're supposed to be your educators. And while aides are a little bit different because they're with you all the time, it was hard. They're still, they're still adults. So an aide, or I guess they call them educational assistants now in school, basically is someone who helps children. Well, they help all of the kids in class, but specifically children who have diverse abilities. So um, I had, when I was little, I needed like an aide all the time. And then as I grew up, I, you know, they were slowly, slowly peeling back um, the time I had with age just to make me more independent. And then uh, enough to, to go to college. Some of it has to do with me. And by me, I mean my personality. <laughs> Not just, I can't blame it all on the diverse ability because some of it's my doing. I was, I got so attached because I had such wonderful aides around me. I got, and they were mostly women. So they were all women. So they were kind of like mm, motherly type. And I sort of, although I loved being independent, I sort of clung on to that. And it was just easier to, because adults, especially people that work with people with diverse abilities are a lot, you know, more patient and I don't have to worry about being, um, saying anything that's not cool or anything and I can just be myself. And it was just, I couldn't get to that. I always got along great with kids, but I couldn't get to that, that step further with them because I, I just didn't know how. It did get better when I got gone into college because I lived in residence and then you're supposed to, you know, you live with six people, so you're gonna have to communicate with them at some point. So I had at least one roommate who, you know, we went out to movies or I um, I made dinner or breakfast for them. So it did get better. And now, you know, the friends from high school that are my age, I'm reconnecting with them a little bit because what will happen, they'll be studying something and diversability will come up or it'll come up in their job and they'll um, send me a nice message saying, I knew you were in high school and I have those questions and so we have a great chat about that. It's great. I loved college. My whole kind of school career um, teachers have encouraged me to be independent and live on my own and and I really wanted that too. So I got to experience college um, by myself and I lived in residence and I had so much support from the college and disability services. Um, but I think the best part of college for me was because in high school and all my other years as a kid, I always had someone helping me. So, and I always had someone giving me advice and wanting me to be more independent in college. You don't really have people there. I had a lot of support still, but I still, I could make my own decisions and I kind of figured out who I was just on my own. And so that was really cool. Like, I think it happens for everyone that goes to college. But for someone with a diverse ability, it just means that much more. 
and it's not much more special to do it by yourself and just to, uh, you know, the little things like eating whatever you want and, and doing whatever you want was really cool. I spent a bit too much money <laughs> but other than that, and I definitely, definitely made some cra crazy mistakes, but other than that, it was an awesome experience. I have a few funny stories. Um, my wheelchair would often run out of battery because uh, Cranbrook was a lot bigger than, um, than in Vermeer. So I made pretty good friends with the security guard at the college, and he would often have to push me up the hill to the college. One of the things I struggled with is doing laundry because the laundry room is is um, up on a, another floor. So I went to Walmart one day and I got a, a laundry push basket. And, and it was a nice day outside, so I just <laughs> decided to wheel home and push the basket home in front of my chair, but I kept, dro I kept dropping it. And so I had like three different people help me get it home. <laughs> and then year two, I tried because in school, um, I went to chef training and they did, they worked so well with me to try and help me cook things independently. So year two or three of college, I tried cooking by myself. And my aunt in high school, and I made this cookbook of recipes, and one was beef stroganoff. So I tried to make beef stroganoff one day, but I had home care, but they only stayed for like half an hour. And then, so I was in the kitchen for like three hours, and I had, you know, sauce all over the place, and I got in trouble with my roommate for that one. I got sent to the residence office a few times for that, for things like that. It was like being sent to the principal's office. I have a few people to thank from the college. The security guard, whose name was Chris, so we had a great relationship after that. We'd watch movies and he'd buy me cream soda. And, but yeah, student services was also wonderful. There was my diverse ability coordinator. Her name was Kevy Rempel. She made sure I had everything I needed and was just wonderful to talk to and, and made sure I had everything so I would set up for college. There was like Laurel Dolson, who was a really good friend. Um, Gerald, Jerry Lee, a bunch of people who helped make college really wonderful for, for me. So I graduated from college with a human service work um, diploma. I graduated in 2014, and that was just a great celebration of what uh, great memories I have. I still go back to Cranbrook and go to the college to say hi to all my friends. And then after graduation, I moved back to the Valley. I wasn't sure what I would, was gonna do, but I just moved back here because um, it was, you know, my old stomping ground and I just, but then, but then things just keep popping up for me. Like, I don't know if I can move anywhere else just because opportunities keep popping up. First, I worked for, or uh, with a friend, Cassie Campbell. I created a uh, project called Access the Valley, which is basically an accessibility guide um, on the Chamber of Commerce website that shows people who may have challenges with their mobility, um, places they can go in town that are accessible to them. It doesn't actually say um, they're accessible, but they can decide um, if they are to them or not. And after that, uh, I started um, Dare to be Different, which is um, a school inclusion program. I started with a, I'm starting this year with one 
class um, with a history project about the history of people with diverse abilities. Um, basically, people with diverse abilities have never really been talked about in schools before, like all the other minority groups are. So I thought I'd take the initiative and bring them, kind of bring, shed light on diverse ability in, in schools so maybe other kids could have an easier time relating to kids with diverse abilities. And also, teenagers in high school are so good at, you know, on social media, advocating for minority groups like Black Lives Matter and, and women and indigenous people, especially with the residential schools. It'd be really cool if I saw someone who doesn't have a diverse ability talk about diverse abilities on Facebook or just say like, this is really cool or maybe we can make this more accessible the same way they talk about like other minority groups. I would love to see, well, after coming back from Inclusion BC conference, I would love to see a world like they're envisioning. So what they've talked about is having people with cognitive diverse abilities in the classroom and um, learning the same things as them, but adapted. I'd love to see like people with diverse abilities and people without diverse abilities um, interacting more. I'd love to see more advocacy from younger people. Um, I just love to see kind of diverse ability come to life a little bit in the schools because then it would be like, maybe I would feel more comfortable with the other students. There is definitely a lot of um, perception and uh, progression in, in the way people with diverse abilities, abilities are treated. Um, you know, I feel like I'm treated so well and we still have a long way to go, but you know, looking back, if I was bored 50 years ago, I would have probably been placed in an institution for people with diverse abilities and, and not have had a very good life, but I'm treated so well by people around town. And um, of course there is more progression to be made like there is with everything else. And I don't think it'll ever stop. Um, it's just kind of how life works. There's always gonna be discrimination of some kind. There's always gonna be places that could be more accessible. There's always gonna be like more people with diverse abilities that are in need of work. And like I said, the Inclusion BC Conference, um, they're wor really working on that, especially with self-advocates who have cognitive diverse abilities. When you have a diverse ability, you, many people want to move to a bigger city. And I get that because there's so many services in the big city and who knows if what, if, what my life would have been like if I would have stay, stayed in Calgary with the many services they have, but I cannot imagine growing up anywhere but in Vermeer. The community, what the community lack, lacks for in services, it definitely makes up for people and um, really kind people. The people of Invermere have sort of embraced me. I can't go downtown without talking to at least two people um, but I guess that's for everybody um, that's in town because it's so small. I get a lot of hugs uh, and every, everyone always supports all my adventures. Um, even today I, I was um, running late for the interview because someone wanted to chat. It's been great. I feel very loved here. Like there's a lot of stigma around diverse abilities, so some people treat me a little bit younger than I am. That, that used to really bother me, but it really doesn't anymore. I mean, I've never had anybody really be rude to me or anything like that, which is, I've been really fortunate that way. You know, I still try and show people that I'm grown up and mature, but in a 
way that's more um, subtle, I guess. So another one of my adventures that has been pretty amazing is I am now a board member of Inclusion BC. Inclusion BC is advocacy board that advocates for people with intellectual diversity, specifically intellectual diversity. And they chose me to be on the board and I'm so lucky they did. And then this past week we went to a conference in Surrey where, you know, our days, it was five, four days and they were just jam packed with session after session of included workshops and amazing speakers, you know, people people with cognitive diversity spoke up for themselves, which I've never really see, seen before. There was an acting group that did plays. There was um, a self-advocacy panel. There was so many cool things. It was just kind of like a week of, oh, of learning and um, it was really eye-opening. I didn't want to leave. So the fact that this exist. First of all, the, inclu the uh, Inclusion PC does so much work for people with diverse abilities um, and trying to get them the best life they can possibly live. I'm so grateful to be on the board, but the actual conference, it was mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing to see all the people speaking, and it was mind-blowing to see all the ideas that they want to have to make it more inclusive. And it was just so cool to see, like I've never seen people with cognitive diversity in action like that before. And it was made me really proud to be part of the P persons with diversity community for sure. So it's been quite the journey, my, my life. And I have so many, amazing adventures. You know, I've spoken um, at the Ottawa Senate Chambers on National Day of the Child for equipment on pe for people with diverse abilities. I've written a book. I've, I've run the torch at the Paralympics, uh, 2010 Vancouver Paralympics. My name's Judy and I'm Kate's proud mum. For 27 years already I've been Kate's mum. Living with Kate's been actually a lot easier than we ever thought it would be. She brings a lot of joy to our family. Oh, when Kate was born it was a lot of mixed emotions. Pretty scary for the first year because so many assessments and but being my first baby was maybe a little easier because I really didn't know what to expect. But uh, she kept doing better all the time and she didn't really have any fallbacks. Uh, in the first couple years of Kate's life was great. We stayed around a lot because she was small. She didn't walk. We carried her everywhere in the small town. We went to every event we could and everyone in the community was so, you know, arms open and we went to all the birthday parties and Kate just smiled all the time. She made, life was good for us. <laughs> When Kate was two, we had another little girl, Natalie, and she was just a quiet, easy going kid, and she would hang out and we'd have tea parties and watch movies, and I think that's where she gets her patience today. <laughs> um, raising Kate in this small community turned out to be probably our best choice we made, being from Calgary. There was always so many events in the community that were accessible. And we just got out to as many things as you want and everyone was very welcoming and it was like the community was, um, Kate was part of the community with open arms for everybody. Everyone knows Kate. <laughs> oh, it always makes me feel a little bit more, it's very comforting. Like I remember one example is, um, Kate had just got a wheelchair and then she was supposed to meet me somewhere and I couldn't find her. So I knew a like, few people on the street and they, they would tell me where Kate was or I'd be at work and or someone would say, oh, we just saw Kate going up the street. The community was always keeping an eye on her. And Kate's school years were always really great. Right through till grade 12, um, 
the kids, the teachers, the aides were always there for her. The big thing was just watching Kate from, you know, how they just involved her in so many things. Like, Kate was in about grade three, maybe even two. I used to go up and join her for lunch every day because she'd take so long to eat her lunch. So I'd sit there with her and take her outside for a while because by then all the kids were running around and of course she's, she wasn't running. <laughs> and then uh, finally I thought, you know, I'm going to be here every day for lunch. Maybe I should just get paid for it. So that's how I became a lunchroom supervisor for six years. <laughs> uh, when Kate was at Laird School, she was using a walker to get around and she was doing well, but the hallways, you know, weren't too busy. But then, and then uh, one of the the therapist said, I think it's time for Kate to get an electric wheelchair, and I was not quite prepared for that. But we went ahead and did that, so by the time she got to high school, it was a really good move because the hallways were quite frantic, and Kate would have been run over right away. So she got along well, and everyone just went off to the side when she came zipping down the hallways. and So that worked out well and has been ever since. For G Kate's grad, it was really exciting, and. Everyone was so proud of Kate, and they were so, she, um, they let the school, let her lead the, the class into the graduation party, and, and then a fellow student came up and asked her to dance, and of course, Natalie and I started crying right away, and Kate's like, ah, this has never happened to me before. Um, all the grad was great, and Kate looked absolutely stunning. After Kate's graduation, she, got accepted into the College of the Rockies, which happened really quickly, which was probably a good thing, and off she went. I couldn't believe we were gonna be leaving her there by herself in an accessible room. But she did really well, but I was a little bit anxious in that time of my life when Kate was off on her own. Uh, over the years, Kate's become really independent. It started, I believe, when she went off to college in Cranbrook. And then from there, she just got more and more, and I started working and sort of pushing myself away from the home, making her become more independent. And Kate starts her day, and she's all by herself. She even makes her bed every morning. She showers, gets dressed, and comes up the little bit of stairs, and she can get out into her wheelchair, and off she goes. So she keeps on trying to strengthen her legs to keep going. She knows when she was little, she didn't really quite understand the able to transfer herself, how important that was, and now she does, so she really tries to keep up on her physical activity. There have been so many surprises with me for Kate, like it, it seems like, you know, every year she'll do something like when she carried the torch and you think, okay, this is it, and then a year later she's speaking in front of the Senate in Ottawa you know, in front of hundreds of people at the Parliament, and anyways, that was a very special moment for us. And another one too was uh, Kate and Natalie skiing together with um, the ski pro program up at Panorama. Every Sunday, Kate would go up and ski for two hours. And then Natalie moved out and back home and she took the CADS program so she was able to ski with Kate. So she has a few times over the year, but this winter was really special because they skied together every Sunday for a couple hours. And so you'd see Natalie skiing down there with her sister, and it was just a moment that I never thought would happen. It was just a thrill. It's so exciting to watch. Something just kept, keeps coming up with Kate, and it's just, it's amazing. Like, she's done so much in her short life. It's been a lot of fun watching, that's for sure. And, and um, there's a lot of family involved, too, that are a big part of our life. <laughs> oh, overall, with Kate, my life has been so incredible. She brings so much happiness to my life, and I just can't wait to see what's going to happen next. <laughs> so my friend and I, Christina McLeod, started, because I told her about my dreams for an inclusive education, and I told her that I wanted to teach students about diverse abilities and all students and all different topics. So we made a mission statement. We looked for grants for a long, long time. And finally, we found one um, with the support of Pete Bork at the Chamber, at the Umbrella Organization to help us get this project off the ground. And we were awarded a grant from the um, Columbia Basin Trust to do basically workshops for kids 
with diverse abilities in schools on different topics that are age appropriate for um, each grade. And so one of the ideas that Chrisanna had was there should be a theme song. And uh, I thought that was a cute idea. I wasn't sure how far it would go, but she told me to write a poem, and so I did. And I like writing poems, so it didn't actually take me very long. It took me like 10 minutes. Of all the work we did, that was the shortest thing that took the song, because when I write, I don't really plan. I just, bam, write it out. So I, I um, wrote a poem, and then we sourced out Bill Cropper and Kurt Reichel from the local Smoney Pants band of Invermere, and they jumped on board. They were so excited to do it and thought it would be super fun, and they came up with a melody for it. I'm so excited we have a song now because everyone sort of connects to music, and so that'll really get people excited about inclusion for sure. My first school that I spoke to with There To Be Different was DTSS, my old high school stomping ground. And the best part was I got to do it in one of my old, the classes of my former teachers, Mr. Werner Kopp. And he was so great. He was so supportive of everything and made sure I had everything and he was enthusiastic. And the kids were great. They responded really well. It was kind of like the pilot project, so I took off from there, and um, I got a great response. Warner Cup was pretty impressed, and now I, I can't wait to do it in more schools, starting in the fall with um, School District 6 and Golden and Kimberly, and I really am excited to work with younger grades, too. I guess my ending message to everyone would be to just um, don't be afraid to be who you are and be unique and just like everyone has has different, you know, timelines of when they do things. I sure struggled with milestones because they were always late, but um, the later they are, it seems like the more special they are when you do accomplish them and then you take, you don't take anything for granted. So always be grateful and just always be yourself and, and don't let anyone try to make you into someone you aren't. And even if you feel that, um, you know, you should be doing more for your community, just to start with one thing, like I did with education, and see where it goes. There's so many problems in the world today that people want to advocate for, but just it can be stressful. So just start with one thing and see where it leads. Thank you so much for watching.